the British cactus and succulent society. Whoa. Um, I'll just go over a little bit about the climate and ecology here. So I'm actually in the southern Atacama region at the moment, which is not hyper arid like the true Atacama Desert further north of here. So if you go up about five or six hundred kilometers from this location further inland, you get uh, the true hyper arid Atacama Desert. But this is a very mesic habitat, so it does actually rain. And of course, we get quite a lot of fog formation. So you can see on the top of that mountain over there, those clouds have really accumulated right on the summit. So up there would be really quite heavy in vegetation compared to where I am at the moment. But uh, we still have an interesting diversity of flora occurring here. So um, one of the favorite Chilean cacti amongst collectors is Iriosice napina. So I've got a really great example of that cactus here. And it's quite big. Um, it's around about uh, two inches in diameter, which is probably fairly common for a cultivated plant. So what we've got here really quite closely resembles what you would see in cultivation. And we're quite lucky to see this cactus in this condition at the moment because it did actually rain here uh, around 15 millimeters three or four days ago. And then a couple of months ago, 20 millimeters. So while it's not a lot, uh, especially for UK standards, uh, sometimes just enough rain here in Chile uh, is sufficient to wake these plants up from dormancy. So you see that we've got some really nice buds forming on this napina here, but they're still probably a week or so away from flowering. And so as Ian was saying the other day, this is a really geophytic cactus. So when it's dehydrated, it actually pulls itself down to ground level. So it's got a really big, thick uh, taproot underground. But uh, when you come up into rockier habitats like these, they still do retract down, but they're easier to find because uh, that really rocky soil is preventing it from going right down to ground level. When you do get into the right habitat, they're, they're really quite frequent. They occur, occur quite, uh, quite a lot. So if you're in the right area, you can see several hundred plants but they do have a very restricted habitat range. I've got another really nice example of one growing underneath this uh, oxalis here. And this one's very, very green in color. So one of the interesting things about visiting habitat is you can see a really wide uh, genetic diversity occurring, different phenotypes of plants. So some of the Eriosis napina can be uh, purple to gray in color while others are much more green and of course the flowers too uh, can change a lot in color and even uh, morphology as well it's a very very rocky habitat as you'll see so this is pretty much uh, all volcanic rock and it's mostly rhyolite or granite, so very high in silica content. We've also got uh, Copiapoa filarania, which is very, very common in this area in the southern Atacama region. And it grows in a range of habitats from directly along the coast at almost uh, zero meters. I've seen it. Uh, growing in places where it would definitely get exposed to salt water every day. So it's uh, highly tolerant to saline conditions. But then of course you can see it growing up in, uh, in the mountains where I am now too. Yeah, there's also some other interesting succulents and xeric flora in this same habitat. 
here we've got Oxalis uh, virgosa. So it's really quite a massive Oxala species. Anyone who's interested in the genus or, or collects them will know that a lot of them are geophytes. So they form uh, bulbs or tubers underground. But uh, Chile is actually home to two of the largest species and the largest species of Oxalis, which is uh, Oxalis gigantea. So it's really quite interesting uh, how the genus Oxalis is diversified here in Chile. Here we've got a really healthy Copiapo filarania. It looks like it's growing underneath the uh, Nolana as well. So Nolana is actually diversified into a lot of different uh, succulent forms here, but this is not in flower just at the moment. But if I had to put my money on it, I would say it's a, it's a species of Nolana. I'm going to walk up a little bit higher into a, a more dense patch of uh, column the cacti up there. So it's interesting to note that in a habitat like this, as the topography changes, the flora changes too. So in this dry part of the mountain here is where we've got the uh, geophytic eriocytes. They're really small, so they don't need as much water. But when you go a bit higher up there on the mountain, you get more water accumulating in those uh, little valleys or those depressions there. And so cacti, which need a higher water requirement, like the larger columnar species, are going to occur in those types of little niche habitats. So we're right on the shoulder season here between uh, winter and spring. So we're just a little bit too early to see flowers on this Eulichnia. But if we were to come back in a couple of months time, it has a really nice, quite a large white flower and really common pollinators in this area are hummingbirds, bees, hoverflies. And you get a lot of Eulichnia forming this really nice candelabra shape, as you can see here. And this example would be really quite old. You can just see that really corky tissue forming on the lower section of the trunk there. So what actually happens when cacti age, you'll see it's got this nice photosynthetic cortex, nice uh, green epidermis there with age that actually converts to cork cambium tissue which we can see here so bark and so this part of the cactus is no longer photosynthesizing it's uh, purely relying on all of the newer shoots for that So I haven't walked too far from where I was before, but it's uh, the landscape's already changing. We're getting a lot of those Eulichnia appearing. So in this part of the mountain, it accumulates much more humidity than in the more exposed areas. Yeah, so these ones are Eulichnia and Breviflora. But if you go a little bit further inland, you get uh, Eulichnia acida. And if you go south of here, you get uh, Eulichnia chorosensis. And the more decumbent species, while this actually looks like uh, a Eulichnia, well, we've actually probably got two cacti growing here. We've got a Eulichnia and an Echinopsis or Trichocereus as well. They can look very similar from a distance, 
But if you get up closer, uh, they've got a different morphology and different flowers too. There's actually a, an Echinopsis in flower up there a little bit higher. If we're lucky, we might see a hummingbird, but I'm probably going to scare them off. Actually, I've just noticed uh, we've got some Dioscoria occurring here. This is probably Dioscoria cumifusa. It's got these tiny little white flowers on it that you probably can't even really focus in, the, in on them there, but it's uh, got that classic Dioscoria leaf. Of course, the most famous Dioscoria uh, occur in Mexico and in uh, Southern Africa. There's actually quite a lot of species of Dioscoria here in Chile. And they do also form cortexes below the ground. So these are probably just getting ready to go dormant now. And they're a, a winter growing plant here in Chile. But because I've got that cortex below ground there, all it takes is a little rain event and uh, that's enough to trigger them into action. So they're very, very early starters in winter. And then uh, by the time spring and summer comes around, they're, they're completely dormant. Here we've got a Echinopsis trichoserius in bloom. This is a very early flower, but if you were to come back in a, in a month or two, you'd be able to see a, a lot more. So really quite lucky to, to see this in bloom today. Yes, yeah, for, for here, it's, it's been a lot. Um, so this is what you would call a wet year uh, in Northern Chile. I wouldn't say it's been completely an El Nino event where we get a different change in uh, oceanic currents uh, coming from the equator. The rain that's occurred has actually been from cold fronts coming up from Antarctica. Got a couple of uh the Loster here as well. And these are actually winter flowering cacti, but uh we're getting right to the end of their flowering season. But if we're lucky you might be able to find you one in bloom still. <laughs> yeah, it would be great if I had someone uh, to hold the camera. But um, I love getting up on these rocky terraces here and seeing what grows amongst the uh, rocky crevices. So, got some more Copiapo, which do really well in these types of environments. In fact, all cacti do really well growing in these kind of uh, locations. Part of it's to do with really good drainage, but they've also uh, got a symbiosis on their root system. So what actually happens is uh, they've teamed up with uh, bacteria and fungi. So if you look at this cactus here, it's growing directly out of a rocky crevice. I mean, deep down in that rocky fissure there, it is going to have uh, more access, access to, to more substrate. But what the bacteria living on its roots enables it to do is actually fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and the fungi living on its roots. So the mycorrhizal fungi actually produce enzymes, which breaks down the rock 
and makes the nutrients available for it through chemical weathering processes, which occurs much more rapidly than a natural weathering of rock. So that's some uh, interesting uh, microbiology there, but it's, but that symbiosis actually occurs with a lot of xeric plants, which is why they are able to actually colonize rocky outcrops like these. Because without having that symbiosis, they're just not going to be able to get the nutrients that they need to survive in such a, a xeric or inhospitable habitat. It's quite a variable practice. Very, very variable, in fact. Some of them can have really notchy chins on the tubercles. And the spines are, yeah, can vary a lot too. The ones up in the mountains tend to have much longer spines. The ones on the coast have got sort of a shorter, thicker spine. And they can also change in color a lot too. So slightly different uh, pigments produced. Some of these uh, copiopole can actually look quite purple, especially if you get them into cultivation where they grow a lot more quickly and they don't produce as much uh, wax on the epidermis. Yeah, okay, so um, the, the endemic animals in the area here are guanaco. Um, so they're like the largest herbivore that you would find, but you also get chinchillas, which are kind of like a small rodent, which naturally occur here too. Um, so they tend not to have such a dramatic impact on the habitat, although with the increasing aridity, they are starting to turn to eating cacti, actually, if you can believe that or not. Um, but some years it can be incredibly dry and the situation is so desperate that they will actually start to uh, eat cacti. And the rodents will actually burrow down underground and eat the cactus roots because they're really quite sweet and uh, full of water, of course, too. Um, but there's also really massive impacts from invasive animals like uh, donkeys and goats. So uh, people in Chile love their goat cheese, but what the farmers do is they let the animals roam around here in the habitat and eat all of the native flora. Um, that's how they're feeding them. They're not actually purchasing food for them. So that has a really uh, detrimental impact, unfortunately, uh, which requires pretty massive uh, <laughs> social, cultural, structural change to, uh, to uh, modify that. So um, yeah, it's something that I've, been thinking about and I don't really know how to tackle that situation it's quite complex um, especially from a cultural perspective I have managed to locate uh, an eriosized glossa in bloom here so it's really quite a cryptic cactus in habitat it's, it's difficult to spot unless it's in in flower, of course, and uh, well, the flower, its purpose is to attract a pollinator. So it's chosen a really nice, vibrant color. Zygomorphic, it's probably hummingbird pollinated primarily. Neopatera, yeah. I mean, anything with the zygomorphic flower was, um, was classed as a, a Neoporteria. 
So uh, all the eras, so I suck you So anything with a zygomorphic flower was um was put into that genus. So you know the taxonomy of Chilean cacti is notoriously uh, difficult and controversial. Uh, but uh, they have well technically been all lumped into the genus Eriosthys, but uh, I still like to stick with some of the old taxonomy too. This one's got uh, a mix of really quite uh, delicate spines that almost look like hairs and uh, some slightly more defensive ones too. Many bulbs, uh, yes, but they tend to prefer a different substrate. So you can get some occurring in this more rocky terrain. However, if I was to head over to the base of that mountain there, there's quite a lot of sand dunes at the bottom. So with that different substrate, that softer substrate, you get a different type of flora appearing too. So Understanding the uh, topography and the geology is really important if you want to find specific species and habitat um, because it has a massive influence on the, the distribution of plants. So in this radius of around about uh, five or 10 kilometers squared, the diversity changes a lot, but you do have to go to specific environments and choose specific substrates to, uh, to find the types of plants that, that you're looking for. And also a lot of annuals actually occur on those sandy dunes too. So the soil is, uh, is like a natural seed bank, just uh, full of seeds waiting, uh, waiting for the next rain event to trigger them off. You get a lot of bulbs uh, occurring here from the uh, Amaryllidaceae family. And uh, it's really quite magnificent to see them all in bloom. And we're kind of just coming to the beginning of uh, the blooming seasons for those types of geophytes. The more time I spend in habitat, the more interested I become in the, the substrate or the geology. Um, because like I say, if you go looking for certain types of things, um, that has a massive impact on what you're actually going to find in a particular habitat. These are incredibly slow growing cacti. Somebody asked, asked a question yesterday about the age of these plants and it's incredibly difficult to guess. The only way that you would probably truly know is to do carbon dating on the cactus. So to take some of the first wood from the bottom of the stem and carbon date it, however, uh, that can kind of be a little bit unreliable for things that are under 1,000 years old. Although I think there's been some more advancements in that technology. It would be really great to, uh, to do some of that testing on some of these plants to get a better understanding of their age. So here you can see uh, evidence of uh, those uh, chinchillas where they go burrowing in the soil. So these are sort of older tunnel networks. When you see newer ones, um, it's, it's really quite obvious. There's a lot of soil, um, you know, dug out on the ground there. 
this is this has definitely been an old colony of those uh, chinchilla rodents, and they are endemic. But very very difficult to uh, to spot one in habitat. We've got really good hearing, so I haven't even been able to photograph one yet. We got any more questions about habitat or about the cacti or other plants that occur here? Yeah, so actually finding a seedling, seedling in habitat. So I've had uh, a lot of conversations with Rudolf Schultz about this. Also uh, Ingrid Schwab and Ricardo came, who have spent a lot of time in habitat. Um, and so basically, uh, Rudolph told me that after a really wet year, a rain event, they went looking in a habitat of Copiapoa Columna Alba, and they were literally using combs to brush the, uh, those, that granitic sand away. And there was a lot of seedlings that germinated. So there are seeds in habitat that do germinate but uh, they need successive years of rainfall to get established. And uh, that sort of is the problem, you know, because with the increasing aridity, the droughts are becoming much more severe. And so while seedlings still germinate on a wet year, um, it's difficult for them to get established with those uh, increasing droughts. So basically in a habitat like this, in the more southern Atacama region, you're much more likely to see younger plants and regeneration. However, in the north, uh, unfortunately, that's that's not occurring, um, or it's very, very, very difficult to find a plant that's probably under, um, you know, several decades old. Actually, here we go. There's a a smaller Eulichnia. It's probably about two inches tall, maybe, if it's lucky. And um, it wouldn't be a stretch to say that this is probably around about six or seven years old. So the last really major rain event here in Chile was uh, in 2015. And it was backed up by another one in 2017. So it wouldn't be ridiculous to think that this, uh, this cactus, for example, germinated uh, in 2015. It's also got some new spines uh, coming out of the top. So it's probably going to grow, you know, maybe another half an inch or another inch this year if it's lucky. But you're much more likely to see something like that occurring here in the southern region where it still rains more frequently than in the north where it gets much, much drier. So basically reproduction is, is still happening. Plants are still flowering. There's still pollinators in the area, seeds being produced. But the major problem is uh, the frequency of water. Right, so the major issues always uh, are climate change, expansion of civilization, so construction of new housing developments, and highways and roads. Uh, mining is always a really massive one too. Uh, but the issue which I tend to focus on a lot, which really directly impacts uh, endangered, critically endangered plants is poaching. So the plants which are most likely to be poached from habitat are in that category. If they're rare in habitat, they're always going to be rare in cultivation. So they're the ones that are targeted. And they've almost always got a really restricted distribution range. Sometimes uh, they only grow on the summit of one particular mountain, for example, where I am now. Um, and so, you know, uh, a poacher or, or a group of poachers could easily wipe out that entire population in a day, for example. Um, so... What we've been doing is actually making infographics, uh, videos, and working on some other ways to try and communicate that information to people. So at least they know 
what they're looking for when they're purchasing a plant to tell the difference between a plant that's actually come from habitat or that's been grown in cultivation. So uh, we don't really think that we're going to have much of an impact on the people who are actually poaching, uh, but the consumers of uh, plants, uh, people who buy plants for their collections, that's who we're trying to, uh, to help identify the source because, um, well, if they want to make ethical plant choices and if no one's going to buy the poached plants, then it sort of kills that industry. So that's, that's the angle that we're taking with the conservation approach at the moment and uh it's happening a lot not just with cacti but other succulents uh in africa uh it's had a massive impact on populations there especially in south africa and madagascar namibia um they're, they're really getting hit hard and it was actually in the media the other day again there's been a huge uh seizure of plants in uh, johannesburg that was headed for hong kong so you know, it's a really critical moment to, to try and make a change. Um, so that's what, uh, that's what we're trying to do. Um, one indicator which is common throughout all poached plants is damaged roots. So if you're going to be taking a succulent from habitat, you can see the type of terrain it's growing in, very difficult to extract without damaging the roots, especially in rocky soil. If you buy a cultivated plant, it's very unlikely that a seller is going to uh, show you a picture or sell you a plant that's, uh, that's had its root system extensively damaged. It doesn't make any sense if they've been growing it in cultivation for years or decades. The other thing is the type of soil that's on the roots as well. So bang, here we go, Iriosus napina. Geophytic cactus, also very poached from habitat. You can see we've also almost got like a clay type soil occurring here. Very silty. So that type of soil is also going to be on the roots. And it's really quite distinct from what you would see on a native plant. Very, very similar thing happens with conophytums and other succulents in Africa. You're going to see that same, same type of substrate out on the soil. And actually often sellers will actually send you a picture of a plant like this in habitat and uh, send that to the person who's interested in buying. Um, you know, they, there's just uh, a lot of the time that they're not uh, clandestine about it at all. Uh, another major thing is uh, the age of the plant can be determined, like I was saying before, about uh, that kind of really corky tissue. So a really old plant from habitat is going to have, it's going to look rough, you know, it's going to have those characteristics. And strangely enough, that's what a lot of people go for too. When they're buying this type of plant, they want something that's got some character. Um, but those are some easy ways to help identify the source. If you're seeing a really old plant, that it looks, it's got really corky tissue. It's, it's going to indicate that it's very, very, very old. Uh, more than likely over 50 years old. Uh, but we have made infographics with more information about the types of uh, things to look out for. And, you know, the hard thing is, is that it's not always diagnostic. Uh, so that's why it's good to always ask a community expert too. But if you want to check that out, we've got a website which needs, we need to work on a little bit more, but it's uh, ethicalcactus.com. And we've got a poster up there in English, but we're going to add the uh, other languages to it, which we're translating. Uh, for example, Italian, Chinese, Japanese. And that's got a lot more information uh, on there too, where you, can, where you can read up about what we're doing and uh, about the types of things to look out for. Yeah. yeah, so this is uh, actually a different species. It might actually even be Eulichnia acida or Eulichnia charantis, but it's not Breviflora, what we were just looking at before. But those spines are really quite gnarly. So uh, probably approaching almost uh, five inches long. So you wouldn't want to fall on one of these. 
I mean, that's fine. You know, it probably would break fairly easily. But you look at some other Trico Sirius, uh, Oreo Sirius, for example, the spine itself can be really quite thick, uh, even approaching eight or 10 millimeters thick in some cases. And so <laughs> if you were to fall on that, it would <laughs> you definitely know about it. So uh, that's really quite brutal. It's, it's got a really good defense system there, really formidable spines. Nothing's going to try and eat it. Oh, good question. Um, no, I don't. Um, but, uh, but if you do want to know that info, I can look it up and send it to you. There, there are some articles about, about the soil pH and these types of habitats. So I can send that through to you later. Yeah, but interesting point. Um, but you know, the, the fog and the, and the rainwater that comes here can also have an impact uh, on the pH. You know, it's very pure and natural water which occurs in this habitat. So sometimes in cold and that can be a, a difficult thing to, to manage, especially if you're not using rainwater. So here we go. We've got a really perfect example right here. So what happens is uh, when a humid air mass actually comes in contact with the mountain, as it actually rises in altitude, it's going to cool and expand. And that's what forms clouds. So that's how we get clouds up in the atmosphere. But sometimes on not, when it's not a cloudy day, you can still get an oasis of clouds right on the top of that mountain there. And that's directly due to a uh, orographic precipitation. So basically, yeah, just the cooling and expanding of air. And so that's gonna make a microclimate right at the top of that mountain. And so what happens is um, with dew and anything, you know, when dew settles at dew point, it, it condensates on really narrow surfaces that cool down a lot. So for example, a spine or a hair or a trichome. So if you come up here on a really foggy morning, what you're going to actually see is uh, pure water condensated in the form of droplets on the spines here. And that's going to actually run down, trickle down to the bottom of the cactus or drip down onto the soil below. So all of the cacti growing here have got uh, some anchoring roots that are going to stabilize them in the rock there, but they've got a lot of superficial roots that are really uh, not far below ground level at all. So they're going to be ready to absorb that water. And, you know, actually I was reading a study. It was uh, only done a couple of years ago. And what happens with the cactus right down in the aerial, they're actually green. They've been stained from lichen, but it's got... Um, trichomes or hairs and what it actually can do is absorb water through that uh, aerial and that trichome cluster directly into the stem of the cactus too which is something that we didn't know uh, even a decade ago so there's still it's a lot that's being learned about cacti and how they uh, how they can actually survive in such uh, extreme places But a larger cacti like this, a uh, larger cactus like this, Eulichnia, is going to act like a fog net. So, you know, when the fog and the moisture comes in, it's going to get a lot of moisture condensating on all of those spines and dropping down to ground level. So it's going to be able to collect its own water essentially from the environment. But if we're talking about a smaller geophytic cactus, like that little eriosite I showed you before, it's got a really thick nappy form taproot underground to store water through drought periods. And also it's small size, it's not going to lose as much water through transpiration. Whereas uh, these larger cacti are, but they're also big enough to facilitate their own water collection. So, you know, it's kind of complex. It's not really a, a really straightforward answer. It depends on the cactus, it depends on the habitat. Probably uh, the Ascoria humifusa uh, also. It's going to have a cortex below ground level there too. Yeah. 
I made it to the summit. This, uh, this wasn't a very tall mountain. I'm only at about uh, 200 meters or 250 meters above sea level. Yeah, so I'm staying in uh, coastal Wasco, which is uh, a small city down there. And uh, yeah, complete with uh, thermoelectrical plants, pumping the atmosphere full of uh, CO2 and sulfur. We've got a, got a nice uh, iron pellet plant down there. I shouldn't be so negative, should I? But um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's the reality. Yeah, people are actually really wanting uh, the government to change the way they do things here in Chile because there's a lot of stuff that occurs here that's not regulated. You wouldn't see this in Australia. There's too many environmental laws and regulations that would stop uh, this occurring. And uh, it even impacts the plants here in Habitat. So these Copipoa filarania are actually covered with, um, I guess it's kind of like a carbon soot. So they are, they are actually darker than the plants which occur further inland where that soot doesn't reach it. Um, and especially if you look at the plants that are growing directly around those, those, uh, those, um, those places down there, it, they get a really thick covering of that soot landing on them. And actually the people in Wasco, I was reading recently, there's a study being done on them by a university here in Chile. They're actually 75% uh, more likely to develop uh, respiratory and cardiovascular disease as a direct result of uh, those thermoelectrical and um, pellet processing plants. But, you know, people don't have any power to change that. It's, uh, these, these are government level decisions. But our favorite cacti continue. They, uh, they still manage to survive. Anyway, this is the habitat uh, today from Chile. I hope you've enjoyed it. And of course, if you've got any other questions that um, you know you think of later, you can also ask me them via email or um, my social media handles too. The British cactus and succulent.